There were once some 52,816 miles of paved roads spanning the Roman Empire. Even as the empire collapsed, cities and towns, traditions and cultures continued to thrive along the roadside. Take the Via Romana. It once formed part of the Roman road that led from Rome all the way to what was then Germania. It crossed the canton of Vaux, the Jura Mountains, and the Bern Plateau, connecting the city of Geneva via Avanche to Augst near Basel. With his Gallic campaign, Julius Caesar pulled Switzerland into the spotlight of history over 2,000 years ago. French Switzerland, the Swiss-French border. Back then, not far from here, six Roman legions fought against the Helvetii and Raurisi. Geneva was the smallest of the large cities. Roman Genava was created back in 58 BC after the legendary Battle of Bibracti in nearby France. Despite Caesar's victory, though, the Helvetian territory remained outside the Roman Empire, with the exception of Geneva. Caesar used Genava as a military bridgehead and the Helvetii as a buffer between the Germanic people and the Romans. Not far from Geneva, three Corinthian columns are left to remind us of Colonia Iulia Equestris, the most important city on Lake Geneva, founded by Julius Caesar in 45 BC. It was a Helvetian stronghold burned to the ground by the Helvetii as they retreated to Gaul. Thirteen years later, Caesar rebuilt it. Today, Chillon Castle sits enthroned upon the Roman ruins. The Via Romana along the southern range of the Jura Mountains. Here, among the barracks, stony remains testify to Bier's military purpose in Roman times. Today, Swiss Army artillery and infantry units are stationed here. For thousands of years, bells have rung out here to ward off the evil eye and as protection against harm. In Vaux, they call these traditional ceremonial bells toupin and for over 30 years, they've been enjoying crafting them. Our ancestors developed this lifestyle. There's respect for nature. And the cowbells are an essential part of our cultural tradition, our folklore. My name is Pierre-André Chantz, and this is the Forge du Camp. It's a foundry specifically devoted to making Toupin bells. This is my son, who's been working with me for seven years now. I'm very proud of him. There's no quote-unquote boss-employee thing. We get along fine. We don't have to talk very much to get the work done. We both know what we have to do. Look, Anthony, my strap's done. You like it? Yeah, as usual. What about you? Do you like your job? Sure, I wouldn't do it if I didn't. <laughs> Great, we'll keep it up. The traditional bell gets handed down from one generation to the next. 
And it's a great feeling to know that a sample of your handiwork is going to be around for several generations. It may be harder to be traditional because it's not so common. You really have to believe in it. But at least people don't laugh at it now the way they did a generation ago. I'm going to talk about the sound. We haven't mentioned it yet. The toupin is the traditional bell for going up to the Alpine pastures in spring. They say Napoleon's army was drummed to Moscow. Well, it's the same thing for the cattle. We have to bell their hooves to get them moving in rhythm. It's over here, Martial. Cattle herders around here are very attached to the sound of the toupin. Each herder is looking for a specific sound that he heard as a kid, that he's trying to recapture. Rod Martial, I'm a cheesemaker by trade. I've been making cheese at La Moisette for 18 years now. When you go to get the cows in the morning, or if you want to know where they are in the afternoon, well, you have to buy bells for them so you can hear them. How else can you find them when they're hiding in the woods at 3.30 in the morning? Each cow has a name. When the flower comes in, I'll tie her up. They know where their stalls are, and they go straight to them. If you have 25, 30 or 50 bells in a pasture, then they have 25, 30 or 50 different sounds. That way, the herder can tell by the specific sound if a cow is limping or sick. He'll recognize her bell. It's a pleasant job. He likes listening to them as much as I like making them. I mean, friendship came first, and then business. We've lived in the same village for years. Lake Geneva named Lacus Limanus in Roman times, the border between Gallia Belgica and Gallia Narbonesis. Near Lausanne, the Gallo-Roman town of Vicus once stood here, a port for trading ships. Thanks to its strategic position between the Rhine and the Rhone, Vicus Luzona enjoyed great prosperity. The old jetty on the riverbank and the basilica and temple ruins remain to tell the tale. <laughs> Under the Emperor Augustus, the Roman Empire had its greatest period of expansion. But as it grew, so too did the pressure on its borders. In much of the empire, mountains and rivers formed a natural barrier that had to be protected. Even today, Helvetians use nature for protection, as we see here in the mountains of Vaux. Hidden away here, 
they built the military stronghold of Pré Giroux to guard the French-Swiss border during the Second World War. I'm demoting you. It's true, you are. Erika, we're waiting for you. <laughs> it's all these buttons. Now it's starting to rain, see? The fort is alive. When I open the place up, and I'm all alone here, it's like I can hear voices. When I go in, I shout, it's me. It feels like there are souls all around here. I feel the same way. I can picture the men who lived here for long stretches. It can't have been easy. My name is Zurcher Rudolf. I've been a guide at Fort Pré Giraud for four years now. I was in the military for 37 years. It was my whole life, my only profession. For me, Fort Prégiro is absolutely fascinating, both historically and technically. You have to realize that it was built in just two years, from 1937 to 1938. 700,000 cubic feet excavated, 350,000 cubic feet of cement poured, all in such a short space of time. It's amazing. My name is Erika Junot. When I was 19, I was planning to go into the army, but I already knew the man I wound up marrying. And he said, no, the army's my thing. So I gave it up. When my husband was still in active service and I became a guide here, he said, when I retire, I'll be a guide too. But when the time came, I said to him, I'd rather you didn't, because the fort's my thing. And he accepted that. It's a man's uniform. They don't have one for women, so I had no choice. If I wanted to make myself even barely presentable, I had to take it in quite a bit. I could have made two pairs of trousers out of the one they gave me, but at the end of the day, it's not too bad. The fort is in working order, technically and militarily. It's totally outdated, of course, but you could live here, no problem.
This fort was never used in any combat situation. It was occupied throughout the war. They used it for shooting practice and weapon maintenance, but there was no actual fighting here. It's a gorgeous day. We can sunbathe. We're lucky. Mm -hmm. There's even a bit of sun. Amazing. <laughs> Beautiful countryside. Fake. It's camouflage. It's not real granite. All the rocks you can see are trompe l'oeil. What you see down there aren't chalets, they're called fortins, machine gun nests to protect the fort. Oh, those are little metal pine trees. They're not really camouflaging anything. They're just meant to look nice and fit in. It's a Swiss thing. Yeah. Further along the Via Romana, towards Augusta Raurica, Orb, founded in 150 BC. Two Roman military routes crossed paths at the settlement of Urba. In the mid 19th century, the remains of an estate were found where merchants and legionnaires used to cross. The villa had around 100 rooms eight of which boast mosaic floors depicting gods, planets, and symbols for the days of the week. in the Jura Mountains of Vaux, Sainte-Croix. Caesar's Gallic campaign led him this way too. 1,800 years later, this little mountain village became an industrial community. From lace making to high precision mechanics. In 1814, the first factory producing musical boxes was founded. Even today, the inhabitants' lives are shaped by the art of mechanics. I couldn't imagine a world without music or mechanics. Even a world with mechanics, but with no music, I couldn't bear it. I like surprising people, impressing them. I love feeling like a magician. This is a prototype for a miniature horse. What I particularly like about this horse is the way the hooves move. It's pretty realistic, almost like people walking. They walk a lot like people, especially with their front hooves. The back ones are like any other animals, except elephants, which go the other way. I don't like to be alone. It's funny. It's a bit of a paradox. 
because I need to be alone to come up with ideas, but at the same time, I need to have other people around. It was the workload that forced me to hire other people. And then, once they got here, I didn't want them to leave. I got used to being part of a team. And I've never lost that, even now. I'm a loner who became less lonely. I love cameras and movie cameras, anything that has to do with the movies. <laughs> For me, taking a camera like this apart is like opening a book, like seeing a new book that I want to read. And once I've read it, I feel like I've learned something. Sometimes I get ideas for my mechanisms for my androids, like maybe a speed regulator, for example. Now I've reached a point in my life where my goal is to be able to pass on what I've learned. I don't want everything I know about building these 18th century designer writer androids to be lost again. I like switching between two different worlds, the purely creative and the technical side of things. It can get pretty loud when they're all going at once, but one at a time, it's a nice noise. I like the mechanical sounds. Building automatons or sculptures is like a game. I've always loved toy stores, so now I've made one of my very own. My name is François Junot. I've been building automatons since 1980. ancient Helvetian city in Gallia Belgica. It too was fated to be burned to the ground by its residents. The Roman castrum, built later, was misused as a modern stone quarry right up until the 19th century. On the shore of Lake Neuchâtel stands Concise, an ancient Roman stone quarry. The occupying forces in the region used the Jura limestone for building material. They built city walls and amphitheaters with it, as seen at Avanche. The Via Romana. At its halfway point, it leads from the Neuchâtel Jura Mountains down to three lakes through the antique Helvetian capital city, Avanche, to Augusta Rarica, near Basel. Val de Travers. It's had this name, Valis Transversa, since Roman times. It was once the main passage between the Swiss plateau and the French Jura region. Mm. 
This is the birthplace of absinthe. The green fairy has been produced as a medicinal elixir in Bovares since the 18th century. Even in ancient Rome, wormwood was used for medicinal purposes. There must have been distillers in every village, because they figure that there were about 150 to 180 people making moonshine in our little valley alone. We've always ignored the ban here in Val de Travers. I've never said I make absinthe, because I didn't want to get fined. Some of my friends were pretty surprised the day it became official. Some of them I never saw again. My name is Francis Martin. I don't drink absinthe, but I love making it. Distilling it is my passion. Here in Switzerland, the people who first got worked up about it were the winemakers from Vaux and from Valais. They said there's something in absinthe that's making people crazy. They have to stop. In 1905, in a little village in the canton of Vaux, a man who'd spent the day in a restaurant drinking all sorts of wine, and I mean the wine they had back then, went home and had two glasses of absinthe. And his blood alcohol level was so high, it was like temporary insanity. And while he was out of his mind, he killed his pregnant wife and two of their daughters. They said that absinthe makes people crazy. I know plenty of people who drink absinthe, and not one of them is crazy. Well, obviously, absinthe comes from Val de Travers in Switzerland. Our French neighbors said it was invented by Dr. Ordinaire. Well, for one thing, he was no doctor. He was a deserter from the French army. And for another, he never distilled absinthe. So that's just a tall tale. I love this place. For me, it's got a touch of magic. When I found it, because it was three stories tall back then, I went all the way to the top, and right below the roof, there were trestle tables with drying racks on them. And the drying racks still had absinthe plants on them. So this drying room was used until 1910. That was the year that absinthe was banned, on October the 7th. It must have been used for a good hundred years. I like nature. I have an old car, an old Chevrolet Corvette. And it's true, it gives me a sense of freedom. But leisurely, of course. <laughs> My job is to open the tap. You're the faucet boss, the tap man. Let's just say the faucet man. That's the bond between us. A passion for absinthe. How is this an absinthe friendship? Friendship through absinthe, you could say. There were three women who started distilling in the valley. 
Then the men got into it for the money. The Gordensia distills. Maybe Willie's wife used to distill. She used to give you a hand. No, I wouldn't allow her to. Good for you. Every producer has a secret, his recipe. They're pretty jealously guarded. I used to have two colleagues and we talked about everything except our recipes. Never. You never put it on the table, as the saying goes. It's a real secret. The asphalt mines of Travers. The Romans called it bitumen judaicum, Jews' pitch. It was already being used by road builders as grout in 100 BC. Hello. So, my name is Charles Hirschi. I used to work for the Swiss post office, but I'm retired now. With those Swiss post vans, I always took the asphalt roads. My name is Brand Hans. I'm a farmer here in Travers. It's a very small farm. And nowadays, as we all need to top up our income a bit, I got another job on the side. So I cook hams in asphalt, here at the mine. The tradition dates back to 1935. Every year since then, the miners have celebrated the feast day of Saint Barbara, the patron saint of miners, by cooking a ham in asphalt. I enjoy taking these hams, loading them into a basket, and then dipping them in an asphalt bath. For about 260 years, bitumen was mined here. In the 19th century, the mine produced one-fifth of the world's asphalt. It was shipped in blocks from Marseille all the way to Mexico, Brazil, and New Zealand. Have you checked the lamps lately? Yep, they've all been checked. I'm pretty careful about it, you know. I know you do a good job. Everything's in order. So I, uh, well, Monsieur Brand and I take care of everything that has to do with safety. Every time I enter the mine, I think of all the guys who used to work here. We walk in their shoes when we do the safety checks. So it's still nice and stable, you see. A little rusty, but there are no gaps. It's fine. Yeah, those two. Yeah, yours too, and all the other ones. The whole section over there is safe. Until electric lamps came in, working in the mine was very dangerous. Up to the 1750s, before the miners went down in the morning, they would send a penitent in. 
penitent was someone who'd been sentenced to death. So they'd dress him in a wet burlap and send him into the mine with a candle. If there was what they called fire damp, it would catch and set the coal dust floating in the tunnels on fire. So the poor penitent either blew up on the spot, or if nothing happened, he was pardoned. Here in Val de Travers, we're lucky. There's no fire damp. I've been lucky enough to be able to work with guys who had been miners. They taught me how to fasten things properly, to lay the beams, and above all, to keep an eye on the cracks in the walls and the ceiling, to avoid accidents. Yes, we need to redo that. There's a lot of mold up there. There's wood up there that's rotten already. Yeah, but we propped it up. Yeah, but it's still shifted. So this is the mine cat. You know why we call it that? Because it's very agile and can slip into all the tunnels. Exactly. It's hinged in the middle so it can go practically anywhere. See, Hans? I work sitting down. Lucky you. <laughs> I always wanted to work in the mine. Maybe I found out about it too late. But otherwise, I'd have definitely been a miner, at least for a while. Mining work still tugs at my heartstrings, though. Three Lakes Country, the largest lakeside wetlands in Switzerland. Running right through it is the language border between Swiss German and French. The former Helvetian capital in Roman times, Avanche, founded in 15 BC. 85 years later, the Emperor Vespasian fortified it with a city wall 3.7 miles long and 75 towers and raised it to the rank of Roman colony. Not far from Bern, a small arena is evidence of a Gallo-Roman district. Even the Romans divided up time, for military reasons, into two sets of 12 hours, day and night. In the 14th century, the modern method of measuring time went through, with the introduction of mechanical clocks, such as this one in the Zutglogge Tower, Bern's landmark. The post of Clockwinder was always a very important one. Because even then, people would set their watches by the Zitglocke Tower clock. Even today, although everyone wears a wristwatch, you look at the tower when the clock strikes. And if it's not right, you set your watch. My name is Marcus Marti. I'm the Bern Clockwinder. I look after the clockwork in the tower. I'm dedicated to making sure the clock is accurate.
As a matter of fact, there have been malfunctions. One morning, I had a phone call from an old lady who lived next door in an attic apartment. She said, Mr. Marty, I slept badly last night, and now I know why. The clock wasn't striking. I went over straight away to see, and it was true. The gears were jammed. Sometimes in my private life, I forget appointments, but on the whole, I'm pretty punctual. Half a minute more. A little less. I'm especially fascinated by the astrolabe in the Zitglocke Tower. It's an image of a world, the celestial sphere as well as the creation. That was the original background. Not only a celebration of art and science, but at the same time, honouring creation. My job has three essential functions. Firstly, to make sure that the clock never stops. That's why it has to be wound every day. To make sure that it runs reasonably accurately. And to make sure that the clock is always in perfect condition. For a while now, time has had philosophical meaning for me. Especially when I'm in the clock chamber and I wind the clock and hear the regular strokes of the pendulum. I think then about what meaning time has in my life. Time has become a very conscious part of my life. Vicus Saludurum, Zolotum. The Roman Vicus, as Romans called settlements with a simple harbor, was founded between 15 and 25 AD on the banks of the Aare. A little way off from the Via Romana, another Roman road linked Vindonissa to Augusta Rarica passing over the Bursberg Pass. It was used by merchants and legionnaires. Even today, it's a well-loved hiking trail. The fascination is in reconstructing the life of the legionnaire, and trying it out, seeing how it was 2,000 years ago. But it's not acting. Sometimes we reach our physical limit. Then it's hard trying to live as they did when we march or sleep in the camp. We reach our physical limits. Psychologically, though, it's great.
Ich heiße Elio Gallo. My name is Elio Gallo, and I'm a teacher. As well as having a passion for Romans, I'm a rugby player. I can't really say what started this passion, but part of it is probably about looking for my identity, because I have Italian roots. It's to find out what my forefathers achieved. The Roman Legion Camp of Vindonissa, founded by the Emperor Tiberius. For a hundred years, it was a stronghold for three separate legions. We're trying to recreate the 11th legion, which was stationed here in Vindonissa. The 11th Legion was the one that was here continually, from 69 to 101 AD, and that left the most traces. We're obsessed with details. We even take photos and make sketches of the original equipment in museums so that we can then recreate things exactly as they really were. Right now, there are more than 20 of us. Some are interested in military life, and some others are interested in Roman culture. I'm a food safety customer advisor. I'm extremely interested in provisions, or rather how the Roman army kept itself fed, and how the provisions are maintained these days. I'm a cabinet maker. I'm interested in military affairs, the equipment as well as people's lives back then, and how the equipment was made. In real life, I'm a bailiff. They already had debt and bankruptcy back in the Roman Empire. Roman citizens who couldn't pay their debts were forced into slavery. They had to work for as long as it took to pay off their debts. It's a pretty similar story today, just the punishment is less brutal. Of course, there are many things about it that can awaken your inner child. But it's really the pleasure of wearing the armor that does it. Although the grown-up in you is always there, of course. Augst in the Basel country where the imposing ruins tell of a city 20,000 people strong. Augusta Raurica, named after the Celtic tribe Raurisi and the Roman Emperor Augustus. The Roman house, 
reconstructed in 1955, offers an insight into life in Roman times with its domestic altar and its bathhouse. The theater, built in 180 AD, provided seats for 10,000 spectators, but only for 70 years. A strong earthquake destroyed large parts of Augusta Raricas. And here ends our journey along the Via Romana. Mm -hmm.